and welcome everyone to the DeepMind Airless uh, CSML seminar. Uh, so today we have two speakers, uh, Luigi uh, Grisele and Giancarlo Pissori, who are going to present uh, their work on the uh, relative gradient optimization of the Jacobian term in unsupervised deep learning, which was uh, published in NeurIPS this year. Uh, just, I'm going to give you a, a short bio of our speakers. Uh, so Luigi is a final year PhD student at the Max Planck Institute um, uh, in Tübingen. He is supervised by Bernard Schultkopf, and his research focuses on unsupervised learning, probabilistic machine learning, and causal inference. He also collaborates with the Parietal team at Enria Paris Saclay, which uh, was, and he was hosted by Apo Hivarnen and um, Bertrand uh, Thirion. And he focused uh, his work there on linear and nonlinear ICA. Giancarlo, on the other hand, is a final year PhD student, uh, I guess as well, at uh, Enria Paris Saclay. And he's working uh, as part of the Tau team under the supervision of uh, Cyril Furtlener and Aurelien Bessel. His research uh, focuses on the application of statistical physics uh, to the analysis of learning processes in neural networks, with particular attention to generative models. Um, so Luigi and Giancarlo agreed to take questions during the talk, uh, which you can either ask uh, by chat or by raise, raising your hand uh, on Zoom. And I should also mention that the talk will be recorded and uh, later uploaded to our YouTube channel. And without further ado, I will let the speakers jump uh, right into it. All right. Um, well, first, thanks a lot, Ilias, for the introduction. And thanks for, to the organizers for, for inviting us. It is, it is a pleasure. And thanks for joining us like right before the Christmas holidays. I hope we will try to make it work. So um, as Ilias said, today we are going to present our work, Giancarlo and I are going to present our work, Relative Gradient Optimization of the Jacobian Term in Unsupervised Deep Learning. So it sounds like a rather long and technical title. I hope that by the end of the talk, uh, we will try to clarify what, what it means. And this is, of course, joint work with uh, Adrian, uh, Bernard, and, uh, and Apo. All right. So um, as a, OK, so as a brief overview, um, Basically, we will start by trying to, to explain what we mean by Jacobian term. And then we will try to explain why it uh, is an interesting problem to think of optimizing this term, and particularly why it, uh, it is non-trivial non for uh, neural network architectures. Um, and then we will try to present our proposed solution to this problem, which is based on relative gradients. And we will explain what this means. And afterwards, we will present some experiments which validate uh, the, the soundness of our proposed model and uh, discuss the conclusions and possible uh, future directions of work. All right, so let's get into what the Jacobian term is. Um, and maybe it is easier to, it is best introduced by a, a, an example. Um, so we can start with the example uh, in which we want to model a complex probability distribution. Um, and so suppose that we have uh, some uh, high dimensional multivariate obs uh, observations X, and we have say X1 to Xn extract extracted IID from a certain high dimensional distribution P of X. Um, now, how can we model this distribution? Well, one possibility is we can think that actually the observations are generated by first extracting a variable S from a simple and known distribution uh, P, uh, P of S. I will come back to what we mean by simple. Um, so this is the first step. And like to, pass to, to go from this simple distribution to the one we actually observe in practice, which is P of X, uh, we assume that there is a transformation F. So that our observations are actually the transformation F of this simple variable uh, S. Um, what we additionally, need to require here is that both S and X live in a space of the same dimensionality. And so basically that F is an invertible function. And uh, so given that it is an invertible function, it makes sense to consider its inverse G. Now, if we assume this generative model that I just described, then we can uh, write the probability of, uh, uh, of X in terms of the probability P of S given the, given the, given the, tra the inverse transformation G. And uh, in order to, to model this, this, the complex probability distribution X, we need to learn this transformation uh, G. All right, so um, how, how can we learn this transformation? Um, so one way to learn this transformation is uh, via maximum likelihood. So what we can do is 
we can take G uh, and parameterize it with a, with a specific uh, uh, parametric uh, function class, such as, for instance, a neural network. And we can try to fix the parameters of the neural network by, by maximizing the likelihood of the observations under our assumed model. Now, this is the point in which the Jacobian term arises. So basically, if we write uh, the, the, the log probability of our observations under the assumed model, we will see that there are two elements which, uh, which appear in equation uh, one. The first element uh, depends on our assumed simple probability distribution. And as I said, I, 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 will, I will clarify what, what we mean by simple. But the second term is the one which is most interesting for us because it basically is this logarithm of the absolute value of the determinant of the Jacobian of the neural network. This, uh, this term is what we call the Jacobian term. So hopefully the first, uh, like the first bit of the, of the, um, of, of the title is, is now clear. Um, the Jacobian term is a term which appears given the, 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 the change of variables to switch from x to, 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 to express x in terms of, uh, in terms of s. Um, and uh, just, to, to, just to remind you, the Jacobian term is the matrix which contains all the partial derivatives of the output of the neural network given the, given the, inputs, uh, um, uh, given the input sets. Now, um, it is worth mentioning that uh, this term uh, appears in, in, in other instances of uh, uh, probabilistic uh, uh, modeling uh, as well. And well, you can simply think of it as a multivariate uh, counterpart of the absolute value of the derivative, which would appear in the univariate case. But maybe let's get to, I don't know, other examples in which uh, this term appears uh, in, in probabilistic modeling. And well, one example is if we try to do independent component analysis by maximum likelihood. And basically the problem is, is is, this, the, is, is, ve is very similar and, and uh, uh, the same uh, expression for the log likelihood of your observations given your assumed uh, uh, sources appears. Um, so in, uh, in the, only, the only difference with the previous slide is in how we, um, we specify uh, the probability P of S. And, and basically this also uh, helps us understanding what we mean by, by simple. So, so one, one way to think of a, of, uh, of a simple probability distribution is uh, it factorizes um, in, in its components. So we have the probability of, of, of uh, the, the density of this vector, and it can be written as a product of densities of the, um, of the individual components. Phrased in this way, uh, the problem of optimizing this objective becomes a problem of uh, uh, independent component analysis where the outputs of the neural network are estimates of the independent components. Um, just to mention it, um, it, is, it is well known that in this formulation, the problem of independent component analysis is not identifiable, meaning um, there are uh, too many solutions to, to, to this problem. Um, and we don't have any guarantee that we will recover something uh, which is trivially related to the true solution. Um, and in order to do so, uh, we need to make some additional assumptions and we need to change the, our definition of the, of the latent probability from unconditional independence to a conditional independence given an additional uh, variable. Um, I will not enter into, into the details because this, in this talk we will not um, talk about uh, identifiability, but just to mention that identifiable and non-identifiable uh, um, uh, independent component analysis, if solved by, by this uh, maximum likelihood under these assumed models, all involve the, the logarithm determinant of the Jacobian. So it is an additional exam example of a problem in which it is interesting to, um, to, to think of this, of, of, this, uh, of this element. All right, so hopefully, uh, we, I, I kind of try to try to explain what the term is and a couple of problems in which uh, it arises. Now let's try to understand why it is not uh, trivial to optimize uh, objectives which involve this kind of object, uh, this this, uh, this term. And specifically, we will try to focus on why it is hard to optimize it in uh, neural networks. Um, and uh, well, the problem is. Um, the problem is that uh, 
both computing and optimizing the logarithm of the, the terminal of the Jacobian is, are, are, are expensive optimizations, meaning they are, uh, sorry, expensive operations, meaning they get expensive as the size of the, of the data increases. So suppose that we have a, a L layer fully connected neural network, which goes from a space R to the D to, a, to the same space of the same dimensionality, as we mentioned in the first slide. Then we know that the, the forward pass uh, has uh, uh, like, uh, the, co the computational cost of the forward pass scales as L uh, D squared. And we would like to uh, have an operation for in, uh, a way to optimize that objective, which doesn't, uh, which doesn't imply, imply a scaling, uh, uh, a worse scaling with the dimensionality of D. Now, the problem is that if we use automatic uh, differentiation to compute the Jacobian matrix, so this matrix of partial derivatives, which we discussed before, then it can be shown that with both, um, both uh, uh, forward and backward mode automatic differentiation for a network as the one we described, we would have a scaling which is cubic in the size of the data. Um, and well, you can think of uh, like the whole operation as involving like um, the, co the computation of the Jacobian itself being cubic. Um, the determinant itself is a, is a cubic operation. Uh, and so like overall computing and optimizing this term uh, has, has an order of magnitude more uh, worse scaling than, than a forward pass alone. Um, and this is, this is prohibitively expensive in many practical applications where, where we want to apply our method to high dimensional data. And uh, basically what I want to try to, to clarify is that like this is, a, this is an, an issue which is a major constraint in how the development of, uh, um, of this field, so like of this modeling complex probability distributions um, has, been, ha has been evolving. So like the, 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 the computational constraint uh, has been shaping the the development of, of the field. So I think that we, we, we think that it's a, it's a relevant uh, problem. And to, to give an example, um, to give an example of what I mean, uh, one important direction uh, in, the field, uh, in the field, say of uh, normalizing flows in which the same term appears because the same maximum likelihood of the objective is optimized is that of trying to find architectures, for specific archi architectures for which uh, the computation of this term uh, is simple. It's not as uh, complex as uh, in, the, in the sort of unconstrained general case. Um, one such example is the example in which uh, we use autoregressive flows, therefore flows in which the Jacobian has a triangular structure. Now this makes it particularly easy because if the Jacobian has a triangular structure, then it's determinant. It can be, it, it can be seen that it's just the product of the diagonal. Um, and uh, specifically the log determinant becomes a sum of the logarithms of the diagonal terms of, of this Jacobian. And in this case, it, it is clear that we are, that we are simplifying because, um, because these are uh, D terms and therefore we can compute these uh, in, a, in a linear time. Um, and therefore like, um, as I said, in, in the normalizing flow uh, literature, there, there, there's a lot of work on, on um, describing um, I, I architectures which have triangular Jacobian while being as expressive uh, as possible. Uh, now, one natural question is how expressive can these architectures be? Can, uh, can, can or transformations, let's say, how, how expensive, uh, can, uh, expressive can these transformations be? Can a transformation with a triangular Jacobian uh, allow us to represent any uh, probability distribution. Um, and there is, a, there is a positive answer, uh, which uh, we, we, we can call a guarantee of uh, universal approximation capacity for, for densities. Uh, and this is based on uh, the same proof which, uh, which shows the non-identifiability of nonlinear ICA in the, um, in the sort of unconstrained uh, case without additional auxiliary variables, which I mentioned in the, in the slide on the linear ICA. Um, the point being, being the following, uh, it is possible to, like the, the proof shows that it is always possible to transform any uh, given probability, uh, probability distribution into, into a simple one, which with the, uh, with the, um, in, which, in which the latent, uh, in, in, into a latent, sorry, distribution, 
which factorizes in its components. And it is possible to do so with a transformation which has a triangular Jacobian. So, so basically, it is, it is in principle always possible uh, to, to find such transformation and to map into, uh, into these simple distributions. Um, therefore, in terms of representing densities, um, the triangular Jacobian uh, constraint doesn't, doesn't in, in principle imply a big restriction. Uh, however, there is a, the, the subtlety here is that um, being able to represent any density doesn't mean being able to represent any function. Uh, of course, if, if, we, if we learn a transformation with a triangular Jacobian, uh, we cannot hope to represent any transformation which does, doesn't have a triangular Jacobian. And this may, might be a limiting factor if we are trying to do solve some, uh, for example, identifiable nonlinear ACA problem, or if you want some, we can call it some disentanglement problem in which we want to learn the true transformation which goes from the sources to, to the observation. And also it is worth men mentioning that in practice, these for, for, for architecture which have a finite uh, number of parameters and a finite capacity, it can be also a, a restriction in the, in the expressivity in, in practice also for the density estimation. Even though, as I, as I, as I, as I have shown here, like um, autoregressive uh, uh, flows seem to, be, seem to be pretty good at representing densities and also, uh, also when, when, in, when inverted, they, are, they, they can generate pretty realistic images. All right. Um, yeah, so just to mention it, so we, 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 we talked about the fact that uh, um, in, in, in the field of normalizing flows, like uh, autoregressive flows are, are, are a big part and they clearly have this computational advantage. Um, there, are also, uh, there are also other methods which try to keep a sort of full Jacobian without restricting to a triangular one, um, but they have other problems. So um, in, the, in, in the normalizing flows community, it, they are referred to one refers to linear flows as transformations of, of this kind. So basically linear transformations where the input is mapped into an output through, uh, through a matrix multiplication. Um, and this of course has a, has a full Jacobian. I will not get into the detail now because we will come back to it later, but it suffices to say at this point that naively optimizing uh, this, uh, the Jacobian for this kind of transformation again has a cubic scaling. And so there are some trade-offs uh, that has, have to be, uh, I mean, one has to take some trade-offs between the expressivity of, of these models and the computational scaling. Um, another possibility, so another class of possible transformations which have uh, full Jacobian uh, are residual flows, which involves uh, which involve transformation of, of this kind. Um, again, the, these, these, uh, these kind of uh, transformations, as I, as I said, they have full Jacobian. The problem is, they can not be trained again efficiently uh, with maximum likelihood. So one has to resort to approximations of the maximum likelihood objective, such as uh, based on um, some kind of, uh, um, uh, like, like this Hutching, Hutchinson's trace uh, approximation. Uh, and so in practice, we are not optimizing the exact objective. And instead our goal would be to efficiently optimize the exact objective uh, with neural networks. All right, so, okay. This was more or less an introduction, an introduction to, to, to what is the problem and what are the so, sort of possible solutions uh, that, that, that there are so far. And now we will try to explain what our proposal uh, to solve this uh, is. And before, before, uh, before getting into the relative gradient, um, it is important, to, we, can, we can try to look at what this um, Jacobian term looks like in practice. So have a closer look at it. Um, and specifically, we will try to write the Jacobian term for neural networks. And we consider a kind like the kind of neural networks which can be written as sequences of uh, uh, matrix multiplications uh, followed by scalar nonlinearities. When I say scalar nonlinearities, it means it's a nonlinearity which acts element-wise on the outputs of the matrix multiplication. And this, is, uh, this would be the case if, you, if we had a fully connected neural networks going from the inputs to the outputs. Um, and uh, of course, given that we require invertibility of our function, we will also require invertibility of all the elements of this transformation. So both of the matrices and of the nonlinearities. 
All right, so for these kind of neural networks, um, as for any composition of invertible functions, we have that the Jacobian term uh, can be written in a rather simple way. Basically, the Jacobian term for the overall transformation can be written as a sum of Jacobian terms, one for each of the operations. So we, so we talked about the nonlinearities and the matrix multiplication. And in practice, it can be, we, we see that the Jacobian term can be written as a sum for each of the layers. And specifically, in each of the layers, it becomes a sum of the scalar nonlinearities and the matrix and, and this matrix term. All right. Uh, and maybe it is already worth mentioning, and I, I think we, it will become important later that this term is a, given the scalar nature of the nonlinearity, is a sum over the individual uh, individual outputs. As I said, the, the nonlinearity is, is applied element-wise on the outputs, and you can see that here we have this sum of from one to d, and this is similar to the kind of sum over. Uh, it is important for us that it's it's a term of the sim of a similar kind to the sum from one to d of the log, p, uh, p, uh, of the log uh, density of the, of the latent variables, which factorizes. We, 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 will, we will come back to this, and I hope it will be clear why, why it's important. Let's focus on this matrix term. Now, um, what, what, I, what I'm going to try to convince you of in the, in the next slides is that this is an important term, and it's basically, I, I would say, the term which makes the overall optimization uh, clumsy and uh, sorry, that, that, that makes naive optimization of, of this uh, Jacobian term uh, complicated. And, um, and in order to introduce like how we go uh, about uh, solving this, this problem, I first need to show you that a similar term arises in another, uh, in another context. And this is the context of linear ICA. So we go back to independent component analysis, now the linear case. Um, so the linear ICA model uh, assumes, uh, is, is very similar to the initial model that we, that we showed. So uh, we assume that there are, there, is, there are some sources which are distributed according to a P of S, which factorizes in its, in, in its uh, components, therefore independent component analysis. And, this, and they are mixed through, through uh, matrix A into the, our observations uh, X. So pretty much this is a linear operation, which gives, a, gives us our observations given, uh, given, the late, the, uh, given the latent variables. And of course, we can define uh, the inverse transformations W, which W being inverse of A. Sorry, I should have written this. Um, then again, I, I think, it, I mean, I, uh, you will probably be convinced at this point that if we write the likelihood of the data, um, we can write the likelihood of the observations in terms of this model, and we will get a Jacobian term, which for a linear transformation is precisely the matrix term, which we saw previously. So maybe this is, uh, sorry for being repetitive about this, but I thought it was, uh, it was important to, to mention this because, the, because I want to show that this problem, if we want to optimize this objective, also arises in the case of linear ACA. Uh, we have to deal with this, with this matrix term. And it is a problem which in, 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 the, in the field of linear ACA had been, uh, been solved uh, and proposed indep in, independently by uh, Cardoso and, uh, and Tamari with what is called the relative gradient. All right, and uh, now I will try to get into, into this and explain you how the relative gradient helps optimizing this Jacobian term, which is what we call the matrix term of our overall Jacobian. So, okay, let's get into this. So first we have to still show why that term is hard to optimize in the first place. Well, what happens if we take the ordinary gradient uh, of that term? Um, basically, it can be shown uh, that if we take the, the, the gradient of these, uh, of, the, of these parameters, of these matrix parameters, with respect, sorry, to these matrix parameters of the logarithm of the determinant of the matrix itself, this involves a, a matrix inversion. So like the gradient is equal to the inverse of the transpose of the matrix. This is basically the problem. Matrix inversion is, a, is an operation which has a cubic, uh, cubic scaling. And since we are talking about a L layer neural network, we have to do this operation L times. And so, I mean, like the, scal the scaling of course stays, stays cubic. So we have uh, that overall the cost is O of L uh, B to the cube. 
So if we now that we have looked at the Jacobian term for neural networks more in detail, uh, basically it becomes clear that this term is, let's say, at least re responsible. I mean, that, that, that this term has the complexity, which is the overall complexity of the of the method um, in the end. So this is uh, what what blocks us. Um, and how does the relative gradient, which I mentioned, which we mentioned, help us solving it? So the relative gradient uh, starts from a slightly different perspective from 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 the ordinary gradient. So as as I wrote above, the ordinary gradient starts from considering an additive perturbation of the matrix parameters and and then computing the best possible update. The relative gradient instead can be thought of as stemming from a multiplicative perturbation. So we, we perturb the, the, original, the, the original matrix with another matrix. So we identity time plus a, a, a small perturbation. If we do so, then we can try to compute what is the, uh, the best possible uh, update. And it turns out that um, the best possible up update can be related to that, which is given by the ordinary gradient, and, it, and which has to be multiplied by a term which is this term in orange uh, on the on the right hand side of the of the presentation? Um, now, the key point here is that this term in orange allows us to sidestep the matrix inversion, which creates problem here. In fact, if you you can see that this matrix inversion is the inverse of the transpose of the matrix, but if this is multiplied with the first element of our term in orange, these two elements cancel out they become the identity. And so we are basically only left with the matrix itself. So this is important because this means that if we take the relative gradient of this term, we can sidestep the matrix inversion overall. And therefore, we got rid of an operation which has a cubic complexity. Um, and actually, now we have, we have, uh, we, we just need, I mean, we, we already know how, how we have to update um, what the updates are given by, 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 by the log determinant of the matrix, and they are proportional to the matrix itself. So basically, at this point, we know that the relative gradient helps us with that term of the Jacobian term. Uh, we, 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 we split it in these two parts, and we know that if we use the relative gradient, we can, uh, we can optimize efficiently this term. I, I, let me also mention um, that we basically already know what the gradient is without even need, needing to uh, compute the logarithm of the determinant of the matrix. So we, we, we already know the, the gradient for this term. We don't need to compute the determinant, which itself would be an expensive operation. So, so basically, at this point, uh, I would stop my part of the presentation. And Giancarlo will explain how the relative gradient uh, also helps optimizing the rest of the Jacobian uh, of the Jacobian term, because so far you only have half of the story. I told you how to optimize one part. Um, maybe if, if there are um, qu questions regarding what I said so far, I'm happy to take them. Uh, bear in mind that, of course, there, there's only part of the story. So Giancarlo will, will say uh, the, the rest. But but if there are questions, I'm happy to take them. Otherwise, we can uh, skip to switch to Giancarlo, and uh, um, and and we can take just questions at the end. Uh, I actually have one question. Sure. Uh, on right to, to, for this slide. So, um, so if we now compute the update term for the relative gradient, it will just be w k or like i plus mu times w k, right? Um, precisely. Yes, it will be proportional. Yes. Okay. And by so w k, you already have that. Uh, that's your input, uh, yep. presumably. Yep. So you don't even need to compute that, not even that, right? So the the scaling, uh, the, the the quadratic scaling is not is not really um, there since this is like a step that you have to do. Uh, but I'm not I'm not sure if this is clear. No, no, no. I, I agree. I agree. Fair enough. So basically, what I want to say is that um, say that you were only optimizing this term. Uh, but, well, basically, the scaling comes from the fact that you just have to make add these. Uh, uh, you just have to add this update to the to the matrix, and so you have to uh, add the original matrix. I mean, when you when you update the matrix, you have to add W right. with something proportional to W, and this is basically an operation which uh, which you, you know you have to do one for for each of the elements of the of the matrix. It's it's, it's only this, but I agree with you. We we basically um, 
maybe I express myself poorly. Um, we don't need to compute the update it's to perform the update, basically. We just need to do one operation for each element of the matrix. Uh, I, I, I don't know if this is I don't know if this is clear. Um, um, I, so basically, I, I, you, as you as you correctly said, we already have the value of this gradient, but we still need to perform the the update at, at each gradient step, and this is gonna uh, it's gonna take one operation for each element of the matrix because we are gonna add. That, that's what I wanted to say. Um, I think I'm not sure if Ilias. Uh... Yeah. Hi. Sorry. I actually my my laptop froze, so I I, I didn't hear uh, or I don't know if what happened. Sorry. <laughs> ah, yeah. No worries. Uh, but basically, long story short, uh, I ag I agree with with you. Uh, we don't. It's not to compute the update. It's to perform the update that we right. that we have because. That, that's okay. Long but so I, I so I guess the 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 term that we haven't seen yet is is the one that's. That is going to be that's going to end up being more expensive than this one, right? Um, um, for computing the update, yes, but right. for, let's say compute compute plus perform, uh, basically it's 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 the same. But this is going to be like uh, it's going to be more clear, I guess, when when Giancarlo explains it. Okay, cool. All right. Uh, okay, so maybe I can stop sharing and 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 we can and I can give word to Giancarlo at this point. Mm -hmm. Um, right. Yes, okay. Hello. Hi, yeah. Okay, can you see my screen? Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay, do you see um, full screen? Yep. Okay, so good. Okay, so we can go on. Uh, okay, so thank you, Luigi. Um, so as we have seen, we see that um, the relative gradient can, can be computed by just multiply by W transpose W, uh, the ordinary gradient of, uh, that we compute. And, and this is very useful because it cancels uh, a matrix inversion. And so it makes uh, the computation of the matrix term of the, ja of the Jacobian we are interested in uh, efficient to compute. Okay, but let me remind you that uh, for our architect for uh, our architecture, uh, the Jacobian determinant that we want to optimize uh, is composed by two terms. So uh, the matrix term that we have just discussed and that uh, here I call uh, TK and, and another term which is due to the nonlinear activation functions and uh, here I call this term SK. So as we have seen, uh, the gradient of TK can be computed explicitly and efficiently by employing the relative gradient, uh, but computing the relative gra gradient for the term SK uh, is a bit more involved. Um, so in general, the most straightforward strategy would be to just use backpropagation to compute the gradient uh, of SK and then multiply this gradient by W transpose W to obtain the relative gradient. Uh, the problem with this approach is that uh, um, the gradient of SK, delta SK, is a D by D matrix and uh, multiply, multiplying this matrix by uh, W transpose W would result in a, uh, in a cubic scaling uh, in the dimensionality. Um, so actually here it looks like the advantage we, ga we gain in using the relative gradient for the matrix term uh, TK uh, is lost in computing the relative gradient for SK. Uh, so as it turns out, this is not actually the case, but to show this, we have to look uh, a bit more in, det in detail into backpropagation. Uh, so uh, here I simplify notation and I consider unidimensional data. So we have D equals one, uh, and we deal with the scalar values and scalar functions only. So here in the image, uh, we can see the simplified computational graph for the term SK. Uh, where the black arrows uh, uh, indicate the, st the steps uh, of the forward pass uh, through, through our network. Uh, so with the propagation, the gradient of SK with respect to WK is obtained by simply computing the chain rule backwards through the network. So we start from the right end with the value one and we follow the red arrows backwards through the network. Uh, at each step, we compute the derivative of the current term and we multiply this derivative by the previous, previous derivative that we computed. 
so here if we call delta k the result of the penultimate state uh, penultimate step in this uh, backwards procedure uh, we can see that the gradient of uh, sk can be simply computed as uh, z k minus one which is the input to our layer uh, times uh, this uh, back propagated uh, ba uh, error delta k uh, so Exactly. If we interpret these derivatives as the error of our network, uh, then we are effectively back propagating error uh, delta, so the error backwards uh, up to the inputs, and then the, um, the gradient will just be the inputs times uh, this back propagated error. Uh, okay, so if you want, this is an intuitive uh, view of our uh, back propagation. Okay, sorry. Um, and okay, this is the simple case for uh, d uh, equals one. So if we get back to the um, to the general case, so for uh, d arbitrary, um, the notation becomes uh, a bit um, a bit more cumbersome. But uh, the idea the idea is uh, is the same. Um, okay. Okay, but the idea is the same. So the d by d gradient of SK is just computed as the multiplication of the input vector z k minus one times um, the back propagated error vector delta k transposed. Or if you want, it is just computed as uh, um, the outer product between the input vector z k minus one and delta k. Um, okay, so with this in mind, uh, we can see that computing the relative gradient for uh, the term SK, um, can be done efficiently, avoiding mat expensive uh, matrix matrix multiplications altogether. Uh, what we need to do is just to uh, apply the matrix multiplications uh, in the right order. So you can see here in the, in the formula, we the parentheses are actually important to specify the order here. The order here, uh, and then if we, if we do this, uh, we, if we do this carefully, we we will. Uh, only employ uh, vector matrix uh, multiplications and uh, vector vector outer products. Uh, for these operations, the, the scaling is uh, quadratic in the dimensionality, uh, which is the same uh, scaling behavior of uh, normal back propagation for, uh, for the ordinary gradients. Okay, so now we have uh, all the, the ingredients in place. Uh, we just have to consider a minor uh, practical problem that is how to access uh, uh, the back propagated error uh, vector error vector delta so this is uh, delta is something that we always compute during back propagation but uh, in practice uh, uh, we cannot uh, um, access uh, uh, delta easily with the common automatic differentiation AD frameworks. So, for example, if we use a PyTorch or JAX, we can ask uh, the library to compute the gradient automatically for us. But these delta terms uh, are intermediate computations, and we don't have any functions to um, to actually access these terms. Um, I mean, of course, theoretically, we can implement a back propagation from scratch, compute the delta easily. Uh, that's not a, a problem. But then we would lose the flexibility provided by AD frameworks that, uh, that uh, let us automatically compute the back propagation with arbitrarily complex um, architectures. So, <clears throat> okay, another way to, to solve this problem and actually um, the strategy that we used in our implementation uh, is then to use a, dum a dummy additive layer AK uh, with some uh, dummy parameters lambda K. So during training, we, we don't learn these uh, parameters lambda K. Um, and we see that if we set these uh, lambda K parameters to zero, uh, the, the derivative of uh, uh, the gradient of these parameters will be exactly equal uh, to the delta K term we need. Uh, and also, of course, we don't modify the behavior of the network. So this uh, solves our problem because uh, then we can uh, just ask our AD framework to compute the, uh, the gradients of uh, lambda for us. This is done simply, and uh, we will have access to the delta term we need. <clears throat> okay, so with this last piece, we really have uh, everything in place um, <clears throat> to optimize uh, our full objective in quadratic time. So uh, let me show now that this is indeed a good scaling behavior by considering some simple batch benchmarks. Uh, so here we took uh, a single mini batch composed of 100 samples from our data set. 
so we computed one gradient update and we plotted the uh, the time the computation time as a function of the of the dimensionality uh, okay, the left plot reports data obtained uh, on, a, on a single GPU and the computation time for the relative gradient. So our proposed method is represented by the green line, uh, while the blue line represents uh, the ordinary gradient uh, computed uh, through the matrix inversions for the matrix term of the Jacobian. Uh, okay, so to begin with, we know that uh, we push the benchmark to quite a high dimensionality. So we push it to D uh, around uh, up to D around 25,000, uh, obtaining some good results. So even for D at around 25,000, we see that computing a single gradient update takes uh, fractions of a second, meaning uh, meaning then that the full training over the full data set for many epochs would be feasible in a, in a reasonable time. Uh, for reference, uh, not that uh, MNIST is the dimensionality of order 1000. So we see on this plot that a single update takes, uh, takes about uh, 10 to minus three seconds. So we are in the order of the milliseconds. And uh, with 50,000 training data, which is the size of uh, MNIST training set, uh, this translates to some tens of seconds per epoch. Uh, so in our, in our experiment, uh, we observed that uh, one full epoch of RMNIST takes around 40 seconds, and uh, that is something which is consistent with, the, with our benchmark. Uh, so as another reference, we can consider also Cypher 10, which is a, a data set that, that has uh, a dimensionality around 3,000. And, and again, we see that still the computation time for a single gradient step is around 10 to minus 3, a bit more than, uh, than 10 to minus 3. Uh, so again, the computation time for a full epoch is in the order of uh, single digit minutes. Uh, and this is, okay, again, something we, um, we observed in our experiments. Uh, okay, uh, then, uh, um, then as another comment, uh, okay, it, in these plots, uh, it is not really easy um, to spot the theoretical cubic and quadratic behavior that we expected, so let me know this, uh, but still see how, how actually the, the relative gradient uh, approach we propose still has a clear, consistent uh, uh, computational advantage, advantage of about two orders of magnitude. So uh, in practice, this is still a, a very good result. Uh, okay, then uh, in the right picture, you can see the same uh, benchmark, but this time on, uh, on a CPU cluster, so not on GPU. Uh, here we can, uh, I mean, the same comments are more or less valid. Uh, of course, we just note that for very high dimensionality, the, the computation time over GPU is better, as, uh, as it's uh, obvious and we expect. Um, Okay, uh, other than computation time benchmarks, we also did some uh, experiments to verify that the optimization behavior of the relative gradient is good. Uh, and so that we are able to optimize the exact likelihood uh, of, our, uh, of our model with uh, some good results. Uh, to, to this end, we started training our fully connected network using the relative gradient uh, over a set of uh, two dimensional toy distributions. So you can see here in the top image, um, the exact densities uh, on the left and uh, the estimated density uh, with our model on the right. Uh, and here we see that there is, um, that, um, that our model is able to convincingly model the, the distribution of, of, uh, of the data in this uh, toy setting. <clears throat> Okay, then uh, as a second step, we also trained our model on a set of uh, real world data sets that serve as a standard, standard benchmark for, uh, for the density estimation task in, um, for the density estimation task. Uh, so in the table, we compare uh, our results to some other state of the art models. And uh, here, let me know that, let me note that uh, we took care of keeping the number of parameters used for each model in this, bear, in this benchmark uh, more or less constant, so to have a more fair comparison. Um, and from the results, we see that uh, the model we propose achieves uh, more or less a comparable uh, performance with respect to the other benchmark models. Uh, 
so this is also a good result and for us it serves more as a proof of concept and gives us some experimental evidence that uh, uh, actually the relative gradient we employ converges to some meaningful, meaningful values for, uh, for the density. Okay, with this uh, I conclude. And so to summarize, let me stress the fact that the crucial, crucial point in, uh, in our work is that um, we propose an exact method for optimization of the full Jacobian term, which means that we can optimize objective functions involved in the Jacobian term um, without putting strong restrictions on the form of this term. Uh, also, we show both in theory and in practice that uh, our method is uh, quite efficient. And so from this point of view, uh, the fact that the optimization is efficient is a necessary condition to, uh, to be able to use our method in practice. Uh, but the fact that we don't restrict the form of the Jacobian uh, opens some interesting directions for future research. So uh, as an example, we would like to try to, to attack the nonlinear ICA problem with, uh, with our method in some future work. Uh, and also we would like to extend um, our approach to other more complex uh, architectures. So for example, we could try to apply this approach to convolutional layers uh, or even just use these fully connected layers we propose as part of some more uh, complex uh, architectures. Okay, so I leave you with the references to our paper and to our implementation, and uh, I thank you for your attention. <laughs>